Sorrow comes to steal the joy I have. When brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I. Stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Show me one has a place to hide. I'm not a captive to
<laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome each and every one of you to this time of worship. I am Susan Hefner Hune, and I am thrilled to be pastor here at Christ United Methodist Church. Uh, welcome to this time of worship, this opportunity to connect with one another, and welcome to this place where our vision is to be a beacon of light, love, and hope to the community. Let me share with you just a couple of announcements. One is Donnie sends her greetings. She and Danny are um, participating with two of our youth on a chrysalis flight this weekend, so continue holding them in your prayers as they... Um, uh, give of themselves and experience the love of Christ this weekend there in Gastonia. So I'm going to do my best to, to be Donnie this morning. Um, I'll try. That's Those are tough shoes to fill. Um, let me share with you a few announcements. One is we've got a lot of things happening in the next couple of weeks, which is really, really great. Friday uh, evening, we have the fish fry. There are sign-up sheets back there. There were so, yep, sign-up sheets over here. There's also sign-up sheets online. Lots of opportunities for you to share your gift of baking or your gift of serving or your gift of setting up or cleaning up or hospitality. So my guess is those of you that have done this before know what needs to be done. Those of you that have not done this before, let's just show up and eat is what I say um, because I understand it's really, really good. So that is Friday. We look forward to that fish fry. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday and Palm Fun Day. So we will have worship at 9, worship at 11, um, Sunday school in between, and then following worship, we will have Fun Day outside, um, lunch, games, Easter egg hunt, all kinds of activities and fun things to do. So if you um, have not brought in candy but plan on bringing in candy, do that soon because I bet eggs are going to be filled, oh, tomorrow? Oh, so then you have today to get candy. Or Monday morning, um, first thing, you can run out and grab some candy, and um, we'll start filling up Easter eggs for that day. You'll um, no notice that we've got information about Holy Week services. So on Thursday, between 5 and 7, you are going to be invited to come into the sanctuary. You're going to have a seat until you're invited to come and sit at a table where there will be 12 people at a time enjoying fellowship, communion, and remembering on that Maundy Thursday. So that will be um, Thursday, an opportunity for you to engage in Maundy Thursday remembrance. Good Friday, we will have the traditional crosswalk. So for those who are new, um, the crosswalk, we meet at the church early on Friday morning and we caravan to Uptown Charlotte where there's a spot where we start walking with the cross in silence. We have a moment of prayer and reflection. And then I hear that, there's, that we go eat breakfast after. So, you know, it, with traditional Good Friday stuff. Uh, and then Friday morning and afternoon, uh, I will have stations set up here in the sanctuary for you to come and engage in prayer stations that will walk you through um, the scripture, the story, and the retelling of the last hours of Jesus' life. And then we will gather together and celebrate Easter on Easter Sunday, 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock and a 7 a.m. sunrise for those early birds. And there's breakfast after that, a very light breakfast after sunrise. That's a lot. What have I forgotten? I said that. Yeah. Anything? Okay. Flowering the cross. Thank you. Yes. My, I understand that it is a tradition here for you all to bring flowers to put on the cross on Easter Sunday. So azaleas should be ready to go. So bring flowers and we will decorate the cross. Thank you for that. Yes. All of these are opportunities to engage in a very powerful week. So I really encourage you, it's tempting to go from Palm Sunday to Easter. The dresses are a lot prettier. The flowers are really pretty. But I guarantee that it will have a deeper sense of alleluia um, and joy if you go through the whole week. So I hope that you will take advantage and participate in some of the Holy Week opportunities. 
Okay, we're going to move into, I think, a time of prayer. Yes, see, this is why I wish Donnie was here. Um, so as we move into a time of prayer, I lift up to you uh, prayers for Mickey Kaiser on the death of Mark. He died last week. Um, there's not going to be a service. And so I, I shared this with early service, and I'm going to say it to you all, that you all have had two church members die in the last several weeks. And I know that they have been church members that you have loved, that you have cared for, that have loved on you, that have been present, and you're, you miss seeing them. And I know that there has not been a space here in this space to mourn those deaths um, and to kind of collectively come together in prayer. So I hope that today in worship that you will find a space where you can connect with one another um, to mourn and to celebrate and honor their lives too um, for Ken and for Mark. What other prayers come with you this morning? Joyce? Is that a prayer or a joy? joy. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Yeah, where did he go? Oh, there he is. Happy birthday coming up. Woohoo. And then on the second, we will be married. And then on the, so birthday and anniversary. That's a lot of cake. Yay. That's great. That's great. Well, we celebrate that. We celebrate that. Wonderful. Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That's an exciting light that is being uh, shown everywhere. So thanks. Yes. Oh, Jonathan and Grant share. And Jonathan's not here. So, And it's Wednesday. Oh, okay. So when we're here on Wednesday, we can sing and have more cake. Yeah. You can tell what I like about birthday. So, yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah. I know, and Dash turns one. Oh my goodness, that's exciting. That's exciting, yay. Wow, all right, well. What? My, okay, so everybody's having birthdays and celebrating with cake. And you can feel free to bring me a piece, that's fine. Thanks. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, it is good to come together as a community and celebrate. Celebrate birthdays and celebrate excitement and joy. Celebrate the way we, as this congregation that is mixed with all kinds of generations, can come together and learn and share and laugh and remember. 
There is gift of community. There's gift of church. There's gift of fellowship. All of those are ways of expressing our love for you and our love for one another. There's power in that. We take that connection and we take that gift of community with us through the week into spaces where we often feel alone, into spaces where we feel challenged, or into spaces that are hard. This moment, this space of love and light, they kind of linger as a smell, as a fragrance of joy to carry with us. So God, fill us up in this time of worship. Fill us up with the gift of life and love and light. And that doesn't mean that the tough times are erased. It doesn't mean that we don't have spaces that we grieve, and spaces that we acknowledge loss and hardship. It just means that in those spaces, we know we are not alone. We know that you stand there crying with us. And we know you lead us to resurrection and new life. So open us up. Make our hearts be a space welcoming to your grace and your love. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who lovingly gathered us up together as a community and taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Sorry, I didn't forget kids, but children, come on up for a time just for you. Hello. Hi. Sorry, you got a substitute Emerson for today. <laughs> Hi, guys. Nice to see you guys on this beautiful Sunday. I was so excited I get a chance to talk to you guys about one of my favorite times of year, and specifically one of my favorite things we do with spring. Now, some of you guys might know I'm a second grade teacher, and right now we're actually teaching about the life cycle of plants. How many of you guys grow flowers or maybe vegetables at your house or apartment? Yeah, a lot of you guys. Oh, that's awesome. I love this time of year, mostly because I love to see what blooms. You start planting usually, if you're bad at planting, which I am, in February, and you get to see all these beautiful, vibrant colors pop up and make your yard into something new. And life is a lot like that. You see, God gives us seeds in our lives. Tiny little things. In fact, actually, can you hold this for me? I want you guys to see right here. I got some beautiful chives. I promise I will be planting and not just letting stay in my car. I want you guys to see how small these little seeds are. Do you guys see how small these seeds are? Just from these small seeds, they are going to be transformed into beautiful plants that are going to provide amazing chives for salads and also baked potatoes. It's kind of amazing if you think about it that something this small creates something so big. Now something is, that is even more amazing to me is how God takes these little small moments in our lives, little small things, and helps to create something even bigger. When I was growing up and when I was in high school there was a teacher I had. His name was Mr. Schofield. And he asked me just one random day if I could help him with his drama class explain kind of a routine we were working on with the freshmen. And I said, ah, not much of a teacher, but I'll go ahead. 
And because that one small little moment, that one small little ask, that made me realize how much I love teaching. I went on to go to college, and I ended up becoming a second grade teacher that I still am to this day. And because that small little seed, it transformed into this great passion of mine, something that means the world. I love waking up every single day and getting to hang out with super cool kids like you guys. And some of you guys, because I also taught seventh grade too. And get to experience life in a brand new and exciting way. What a shame it would be if we took those little tiny seeds, these little small things, and just forgot about them. Don't you think? There'll be no new life growing from those small little things, no new experiences, no new passion, and no new ways that we can go and show the world God's love. Because God gives us these seeds, these little tiny seeds of love that we can show, to, uh, show God's big passionate love for others with. Just by being kind, showing that we care to other people, we are able to share the words and messages of God, which I think is pretty neat. I want you guys to bow down. So whenever you do what God asks you to do, I want you guys to think about a seed that you've just planted. Just think about it like a seed. The seed that God can use to grow something wonderful. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, thank you so much for giving us all the seeds in our life and helping us to plant the seeds that we do have and recognize them for their beauty. I pray that those seeds that are in our lives grow to become beautiful flowers of your love, your hope, your message. Amen. Thank you. And I'm going to invite Nick to come forward and share a few words with us this morning. After he's, man, you're doing all kinds of things this morning. You need an extra set of arms. Oh, oh, I love those too. Thank you. Now you can hear me, right? All right, I'm Nick Elam. And I come to you today as chairperson of the Finance Committee. I know what you're thinking. There he is again with his hand out, I know, but relax. Uh, we decided at our, at our last quarterly meeting that we should address the congregation periodically or more regularly on what's going on financially in the church, just in the interest of transparency. Uh, so I'm going to cover kind of four things today. Number one, I want to see... Oh, I want to make sure we're transparent about the way we use donations that are made to the church. It's important. I want to tell you where we stand financially at, at this time. Uh, I'll be addressing any concerns in regard to large expenses that are on the Mind you that your contributions do a lot more here than just keep the lights on. I'll start with our current financial situation. We ended last year and a deficit, so not a great way to start off the year. But keeping in mind, we had a lot going on here last year. We had three different ministers. We had the pandemic to deal with. We had major expense in the HVAC system that we installed. So there was a lot happening, a lot of constraints put on us. But uh, so it's not um, unusual or not surprising that we would end the year in a deficit. Uh, but it is important to note that our annual budget that this church is just over $343,000, which is quite modest when you consider all that goes on at this church. You heard Susan alluding a while ago to all the things that are going on just in the next week or two. Uh, it's pretty amazing all that we're able to accomplish with what we have. As of the end of February this year, our contributions are up $15,339 over last year this time. That's a great thing. Our expenses are also up, but only $3,800. So we're ahead of the game in terms of where we were last year in terms of expenses and revenue. That's a good trend and one that I hope we can sustain. I trust that we are going to sustain. As of this past week, our revenues were $64,601 year to date. 
with expenses of 67936 which means we spent roughly $3,300 more than we took in. But given this time of year, that's not uncommon, so it's not something that caused me great alarm or concern at this point. But again, I want to keep you abreast. Uh, we do have some reserves uh, that consist mostly of designated funds that have been given to church. When I say designated funds, I mean funds that members or people have donated for specific purposes. It might be a benevolence fund. It might be for parking lot repair. It might be for the youth. There's any number of things that they can designate funds so that they know those funds are used specifically for that purpose. Uh, overall, we're doing much better than last year. But that doesn't mean we can take our foot off the gas, folks. So I uh, appreciate all that's going on, but uh, we got to keep the momentum going. Uh, we still owe $28,000 on this new HVAC system that we put in here. Uh, we have the funding in place to cover it. The reason we haven't paid it is because there's some ongoing issues with the installation, and until all that's settled out, we won't pay the, the remaining $28,000. Other than that, there are no huge on the horizon that I'm aware of. I hope I don't jinx us. <sighs> Talking about finances in a church setting can be a little uncomfortable sometimes, uh, but dealing with money and contributions and expenses is necessary. As I mentioned earlier, it's not just about keeping the lights on, the heat on, the AC working here, though. Your contributions here do a lot more than that. They allow us as a church to be a beacon of light, love, and hope in our community. Sorry. Some of the ways that we're doing that right now include Room at the Inn, where we're reaching into our extended community to help those in need. Our church fellowships events like Palm Fun Day coming up, we do trunk or treat in the fall. We have preschool, small group meetings on Wednesday nights, Girl Scouts, and all kinds of other things going on. Next Friday, we're putting on a fish fry right up here in the Carl Roberts building. Plans are being made to offer pickleball at our Family Life Center to anyone in the community. It's just one more way that we can connect with folks outside of our church, trying to bring them in. We have an active and vibrant youth group consisting of our own kids, as well as some from outside our church. They'll spend a week this summer doing work for people in need through the Carolina Cross Connection. And I've had some involvement with that, a small involvement with that, and I can tell you that's an excellent program that not only helps people uh, in the bigger community, but it's also great for the youth in our church. It's a very spiritual connection. These are ways for us to continue reaching out to the unaffiliated. There are people in our community who might be looking for something more than just existing, and this is a way they can connect with us and get involved and learn about our faith, and that's good stuff. I'm, I'm reluctant to say this, I, but I say it anyway because a good friend of mine once said to me, folks, we ain't no country club. We are a church. And we do good work. That's what churches do. That's what your contributions do. And we try to be good stewards with that. We make every effort to stretch it as far as we can. I want to thank you for all the gifts you provide, and not only money, but in your time and your talents. It's all critical to making this all work. And I, uh, I want to thank everybody for that. Uh, we get a lot done with what resources we have. Take enough of your time today, but if you have any questions for me in regard to finances, see me later. If I can't answer them, then I'll try to find the answer for you. Thank you. Thank you. We give because God first gave to us. And we share because what we have is not ours. It has been entrusted to us, and we are called to be good stewards. So thank you, Nick, for reminding us of the wonderful ways this church is being a good steward of all of the resources. So I invite our ushers to come forward.
During this season of Lent, we have been considering blessings that, that don't seem quite um, typical. 
And the reason being is because sometimes in church, we always, you know, we love resurrection. We love Easter. We love um, the, the joy of God. And we also acknowledge that we are people that live in pain and we are in spaces that are broken. And so Lent is really an opportunity to acknowledge those places and spaces and find blessing in those spaces and places. So it's our fifth Sunday of Lent. And the text is a long one. So take a deep breath and hear this story from the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, Jesus stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you and you're going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of the world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. When she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews were with her in the house, consoling her. They saw Mary get up and quickly go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, And the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. 
So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of a blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I've said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Blessed are we who mourn, O God. May our prayers rise up to you with a fragrance that lets you know we deeply desire to be in connection with you, to love you more, and to love our neighbors more. For it is in the name of the Christ that we pray. Amen. Do you have a smell that when you catch a whiff of it, it just takes you to another place? If I smell fresh cut grass, I instantly am back home as a little girl and I can look out the back bay window and see my dad mowing grass. If I smell that sweet grass, that the really sweet smelling, then I go to Camp Tacoa for some reason. That's what I think of. Coconuts make me think of the beach sunscreen and the warm sand, and I can almost hear the waves. If I smell pinto beans, I'm immediately transported to the hollers of Appalachia, where when I was in high school, we worked on the home of the Hatfields, of the Hatfields and the McCoys. I'll tell you about that another time. The mom cooked pinto beans for her family one day. It was the only meal that they had that all five children would get, and I could smell those pinto beans. And so when I smell pinto beans, I go to that holler, and I think often of the Hatfield. Smells are powerful, aren't they? I love the smell of coffee in the morning. Smells take me places that I'm not there but I can be transported with memories. They are powerful. The gift of smell is powerful. When I take my dogs to be boarded, I usually take a blanket that has been close to me um, so that they know that I'm with them even when I'm not. I'm not the only one who does that, right? Maybe I am. Smells are powerful. According to a biologist and an olfactory specialist, somebody who specializes in smells, they say that smell and memory seem to be so closely linked because of the brain's anatomy that when we smell things, smells are handled by this olfactory bulb in the front of our brain that sends information to the other parts of our brain for further processing, and they go directly to spaces of memory and emotion. Now, I know that some people lose their smell, and I've heard of some people as they age have lost their smell, but biologists say don't worry because our noses are like any other muscle, and that if you begin to lose your sense of smell, you can exercise that muscle every day by intentionally and purposefully and like being aware of breathing in and noticing what you smell, that you can start to regain your smell by practicing smelling. The Gospel of John seems to be very concerned about smells. 
And in our text today, we find out that Lazarus is dead. Not kind of dead, not a little dead. He is dead, dead. He is so dead that we are told he stinks. And I love it, the King James Version says it, uh, in that passage where the Lord, he's been in the tomb for four days. There's already an odor. The King James Version says he stinketh. John wants us to know that Lazarus is dead, dead. And that what Jesus is about to do is going to be more than just a gentle nudge to wake somebody up. He's got some serious work to do. He smells. The smell of death permeates this passage. And yet... In this passage, Jesus seems to be moving slower than molasses, doesn't he? Jesus, your friend, Lazarus, has died. Uh, okay, I I'm just going to hang out here and wait a couple more days. And then Jesus begins to make his way there, and he doesn't even get all the way to the house. He still hangs out on the outskirts of the village and, and talks for a little bit and, and still waits before he gets close to where the smell is. Jesus is in no rush, in no hurry to get to the tomb and to perform this act of resuscitation. It's almost as if Jesus wants us to stay in that place of mourning for a while. I, I don't know if any of you all have experienced this, so I... I do lots of fun funerals. That's just part of the job. And there was a time that I was doing a funeral, and I encountered something. I, I didn't know quite what to do. So the sanctuary was open, and the casket was in the front, and it was open, and um, it was visitation time for the family, and um, people could come and view. And uh, we had about five minutes before it was time for the um, the funeral home people to come and close the casket and thus start the funeral. Um, because I never do funerals with open caskets because it's a funeral of life and resurrection, right? That's who we are. We're resurrection people. So I'm sitting at the end of the pew while family members are still greeting when there were a few family members that came up to the casket and started taking pictures. Have y'all seen this before? You've seen... I did not know what, I thought, what in the world is happening here? And I sat there, I'm pretty sure I texted friends because I, I didn't know what to do. And I just wanted it to stop. I just, like, I was feeling uncomfortable. I was like, what are they doing? What, what is going, why would they want a picture? This is open casket, like, why would they want that? And I sat there feeling very uncomfortable and thinking, maybe I'll just go and quickly close it and let's start, let's start playing Amazing Grace or something. Let's start the service of resurrection. But I've thought a lot about that moment and thought, you know what? Maybe they're on to something. Maybe I'm too quick to want to hurry up to what the resurrection, the, the feeling good, the wipe away the tears, but maybe I need to stay in the space of the grief for a little bit. And maybe I need to, to do what Jesus does, which is not rush, but stay and mourn the loss, cry, grieve. We're told that the Jews are in the house with Mary and Martha. They are there. Those were professional mourners, so to speak. People who would show up to homes of those who have died and help the family mourn. They would show up and cry and, and, and offer tears and, and help the family process their grief by crying out loud and, and going with them to cry and grieve. They were welcomed into homes. And Jesus stays and is disturbed and he doesn't rush through that. He doesn't pass over it. He cries. He knows that there is gift in mourning and lamenting. He knows that part of being faithful 
is lamenting, being sad, grieving things that are lost. So there is Jesus in this space of death and, and loss and pain and smell that is not good. Interestingly enough, now John talks about it in this chapter. He says, Mary and Martha, this is, this is who the Mary that pours out um, and anoints Jesus uh, before his burial. Well, that doesn't actually happen until the next chapter, which is kind of funny. Like John's already telling us what he's getting ready to write. That happens in the next chapter. Now, we hear about this story at different points in other Gospels, but in the Gospel of John... We hear that it's Mary, of Mary and Martha, and we hear the type of ointment that she pours out on Jesus, and it's nard. I have nard going. Do you smell it? It's not as strong as I thought it was going to be. It's kind of a woodsy smell, this nard. Um, it's supposed to de-stress. So does anybody need to come closer? You can. De and it's supposed to help with insomnia. Now, Lauren Winter, who is a theologian, a preacher, and a seminary professor, as I was doing my research this past week, she writes a little more about this fragrance that is poured out onto Jesus. And I told my friends I was going to say this, and they were like, what are you going to do with that? And I said, I don't know, but I have to mention it. So nard is not only for insomnia and stress, it's also been used for healing properties for uteruses, for reproduction, for new life. Now, folks, why in the world, after Mary and Martha and Jesus and Lazarus had this incredible experience, right? What do they do? They go and celebrate, and they have a meal. And then... A jar of nard is poured out onto Jesus. Why of all the spices? And maybe it's because Mary knows that Jesus is going to be the one to bring in new life. Maybe Mary knows that Jesus has just been standing in the place of stench and is about to enter it again. And that this ointment might cover him and bathe him. And that when he is in his deepest place of pain and the, and the deepest face of grief, that he might catch a whiff of life and companionship and the presence of God. I don't know what you're smelling this morning. Maybe you're in a place where you are overwhelmed by the fragrance of grief, of loss, not just of loved ones, but loss of all types of relationship, loss of expectations, loss of, of security. Maybe you're overwhelmed by the stench of grief and pain. know that Jesus is standing there with you. And Jesus is crying in that space. And Jesus also is the one who will usher in this fragrance of new life and resurrection and restoration. And you don't have to, to be either or. You can have one foot in both of those spaces and places. But the gift of our faith is that we have a way in worship to pray. And our prayers, Scripture say, go up, rise up like incense. And so I just imagine God breathing in and noticing our prayers and maybe our prayers remind God of a sweet, gentle rain or fresh-cut grass.
and they remind God of our faithfulness, of our authenticity, of our vulnerability, and of our deepest hope and desire for new life. And as God breathes that in, God smiles. Let us pray. God, you know life is hard. And too often we think we have to rush and hurry out of the tough spaces to get to the joy. And your son reminded us it's okay to stop and to acknowledge our grief and our pain and to even let that stench be noticed. And that the gift of community and the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, and the gift of grace is the gift of ointment poured out for healing, for restoration, and for new life. And for that, oh God, we give our thanks. And we prepare for the holiest of holy weeks. Amen.
As you go forth from this place, go and take deep breaths. Stop and smell. And if the smell is one that is not so pleasant, know that Christ stands there with you in that space and will lead you to a place of smelling the sweet smells of lilies of Easter, resurrection and hope. Go in God's grace and peace. Amen and amen. Seek first the kingdom and all